RL circuits going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in this lesson, we're going to deal with circuits that have both resistors and inductors. We'll talk about them in similar fashion to the way we talked about RC circuits a few chapters ago. We're going to talk about the time dependence of the current in an RL circuit, and we'll talk briefly about the potential energy stored in an inductor as well. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, an RL circuit has both a resistor and an inductor. And a resistor is called a resistor because it is providing resistance to the flow of current in the circuit. Well, the inductor is going to provide resistance to the change in the current or the rate of change in the current in the circuit instead. And we learned in the last chapter, when you've got a circuit arranged in a loop, there's some self-inductance. And that self-inductance gives you kind of like a back EMF. It opposes the change in current. And as a result, your current doesn't reach the maximum value all at once, as predicted by Ohm's law. It takes a little bit of time. Well, that's what we want to kind of take a look at here is this time dependence. Now, one thing to know, we're going to have some bona fide inductors in our circuits in this chapter. And when you have a bona fide inductor in your circuit, you kind of ignore any self-inductance due to the nature of having a loop, if you will, of wire like we learned in the last lesson. We did a similar fashion with resistors, right? When we had an actual resistor in a circuit, we ignored any contribution of resistance by the wires in the circuit itself. Now we learned about how to calculate such resistance related to the resistivity and the length of the wire and the cross-sectional area, but if you actually have resistors in there, we just assume that the resistance of the resistors is much higher than any resistance in the wires. Well, the same thing here. So here's our symbol for an inductor in a circuit, and when you actually have an inductor in the circuit, we ignore any self-inductance due to the nature of just having a loop for the shape there. So just keep that in mind. So if we take a look at this time dependence for the current in an RL circuit, it should be an equation that looks somewhat similar. We had a similar equation dealing with like the charge or potential difference across a charging capacitor. So and in this case, we're going to reach this maximum current here as predicted by Ohm's law. Notice it's delta V over R effectively. That's the maximum value. So and at big periods of time, we're going to have E to the negative infinity, which is zero. And that term goes away at very large times. And you're just left with the current equaling the current you'd predict according to Ohm's law. All right, and just like we saw with RC circuits, once you've gotten past five time constants, so let's say we calculate a time constant to be like five seconds. Well, once you've gotten past 25 seconds, five time constants, we kind of think of that you've reached the maximum, in this case, the maximum current. And so uh, it's truth be told, that's, that's the point where you reach like 99.3% of your current or something like that. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's kind of a rule of thumb. Past five time constants, you've reached the max in practice, or at least in principle. All right, now the time constant here in an RC circuit was equal to R times C. Well, in an RL circuit, it's equal to the inductance divided by the resistance. And it's going to have units of seconds in SI units. And it should, because if you're dividing time by tau, they should have the same units being part of the exponential here. What's up here for, uh, for the power of the exponential should not be, uh, or should be unitless, I really should say. So these should both have units of seconds. And indeed, if you take inductance in Henry's divided by the resistance in ohms, you will find that it will have units of seconds. If you recall, the Henry was a volt second per ampere. So, and if you kind of take a look at resistance, well, again, delta V equals IR from Ohm's law. So R is equal to delta V over I. It's a volt per ampere. And so if you divide a volt second per ampere over a volt per ampere, you're only gonna be left with seconds. And so this time constant does indeed have units of seconds. All right, so a couple things to take a look at the graphical representation of this equation. So if you look initially, the current is zero, and it's going to asymptotically approach that maximum value so of the EMF over R, or delta V over R. If you look, though, once it reaches that value, it asymptotically approaches it, the slope kind of goes to zero, at least approaches zero. And that means the rate of change in the current over time is approaching zero as well. The rate of change in current over time is the slope on this graph. Well, where is the slope? the greatest, the steepest. Well, that's right at the beginning. And so an inductor is going to provide the greatest resistance to the change in current at the beginning and effectively go to no resistance at the end. And so we're going to find that, you know, we can calculate the potential drop across an inductor. We learned how to do that in the last lesson. It was 
this guy here, negative L times delta I over delta T. And because delta I over delta T, the slope of this graph is the greatest here, you're gonna get the biggest potential drop initially across the inductor. But once you reach your max current, that slope goes to zero and effectively there'll be no potential drop across this inductor. That'll be important for some of the questions we answer here in a little bit. So let's dive into some questions. I think we're ready. Actually, we got one more thing. Let's talk about the potential energy stored in inductor. So potential energy in stored in inductor is one half Li squared. It's effectively being stored as a magnetic field. Now inductor is gonna be a coil of wire. It might be a solenoid. All solenoids will function as inductors, but not all inductors are solenoids, but it's typically a coil of wire. So we symbolize it in a circuit with this lovely symbol or something looking very similar to this symbol right here. So, and in this case, if you notice, the formula for potential energy is very similar to some of the ones we've seen, at least in format. So if you recall for uh, a capacitor, we had one half C delta V squared. Well, here it's one half Li squared, L being the inductance, I being the current. And so if you notice at the very beginning where the current is zero, there's no potential energy stored in the inductor. And once you reach that maximum current, that's where you reach the maximum potential energy stored in an inductor. And that makes sense because when you get the maximum current through the inductor, you also get the maximum magnetic field right down its middle. And again, an inductor is really storing its potential energy as a magnetic field. So now let's work on a series of questions. So all the questions we're gonna deal with, the five, five parts to this question, and they're all dealing with this lovely diagram right here. So the first question says, what is the current passing through the resistor uh, a very long time after the switch is closed. We're gonna close the switch in a very long time after that switch is closed, i.e. once we've reached peak current, if you will, or max current. So the question is, what is the current passing through the resistor? So, well, what the question really is then is what is the max current? And in this case, we just use Ohm's law. It's just as if the inductor is not even there and we just say, so R is gonna equal delta, v, I'm sorry, I is gonna equal delta V over R. And so the first part of this question It's just 12 volts over 4.0 ohms, which is gonna equal 3.0 amps. That's the first part of the question. So after a very long time, it's just as if the inductor wasn't even there as far as how much current is flowing through it. All right, what is the potential drop across the resistor immediately after the switch is closed? So a couple things to note. Kirchhoff's rules still apply. You can have a potential drop across the resistor. You can also have the potential drop across uh, the inductor as well. Now for the inductor, there's our formula for potential drop. For the resistor, we learned that the potential drop delta V was going to be negative IR. And you might be like, that's not Ohm's law. And I just want to reflect that it's a potential drop here. It's negative IR across that resistor. And for any single loop, the potential increases of any EMF sources are balanced by decreases so across either resistors in this case or inductors in this case. And so a 12 volt increase means that between the resistor and the inductor, there's gonna be a 12 volt decrease combined between the two at any point in time. Well, the next question says, what is the potential drop across the resistor immediately after the switch is closed? Well, immediately after the switch is closed, right at that instant, there's no current flowing yet. So the current is zero. And so at that exact instant, if there's no current, then there's no potential drop across the resistor. And so the answer to that second question, what is the potential drop across the resistor immediately after the switch is closed is zero. Which takes us to our next question, what is the potential drop across the inductor immediately after the switch is closed? And again, right when you close the switch, that's when the rate of change in the slope is at its greatest. And that's therefore gonna be when the inductor has its highest inductance and you're gonna get the biggest potential drop across that inductor. Well, in this case, we, we can kind of try and calculate this out, you know, but we don't really know the rate of change of the current over time. But we do know though with Kirchhoff's loop rule is there's a 12 volt increase here and immediately after it's changed, there's no drop across the resistor. So all 12 volts must be dropped across the inductor. And so the uh, potential difference across that inductor is gonna be negative 12 volts. All right, fourth part of the question here. What is the current passing through the resistor two milliseconds after the switch is closed? So now we're somewhere around two milliseconds past the switch being closed, or not around, we're right at exactly two milliseconds after the switch being closed. And the question is where on this lovely curve are we? Well, we should calculate the time constant to kind of get an idea of where we're at. And so in this case, if we look at that time constant, tau equaling L over R, We've got L is 8.0 millihenries, that's 0.0080 henries. 
all over r 4.0 ohms. And so in this case, 8 divided by 4 is 2, so 0 0.008 divided by 4 is going to be 0 0.002. And again, that's going to have units of seconds. And notice 0 0.002 seconds, that is 2 milliseconds. So when this question says, what is the current passing through the resistor 2 milliseconds after the switch is closed, that's the time we're given. It is 2 milliseconds. And we'll plug this into our lovely formula here. And in this case, the epsilon over R we already figured out was going to be 3 amps for the maximum. We'll just plug that right back in. Times 1 minus E to the negative 0 0.002 seconds over 0 0.002 seconds. So the time we're at is 2 milliseconds, and the time constant itself was equal to 2 milliseconds. And so we've really got 1 minus E to the negative 1. It turns out after one time constant, it's well established, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 63%. Uh, of your maximum current and 63% of 3 amps, two-thirds of that would be about 2 amps. So let's put the numbers actually in here. So we've got 3 times, parentheses, 1 minus e to the negative 1 in parentheses, and we're going to get 1.896, which I'm going to round to 1.9 amps. All right, so it was right around two amps, just like we predicted, 1.9 amps to be exact to two sig figs. And finally, the last part of this question says, what is the potential energy stored by the inductor a very long time after the switch is closed? And again, that very long times means we've reached the maximum and we can plug that in for I here with this potential energy formula. And so in this case, we're gonna get potential energy equals one half. And again, our 0 0.008 Henry's. So times that 3.0 amps squared. We'll let our calculator do some heavy lifting, but we could probably do this in our head. So 9 times 8 is 72. So, uh, and then 72 divided by 2, or times a half, would be 36. So you could do this in your head. 0.5 times 0 0.008 times 3 squared is going to be 0 0.036. And with all SI units used here, that's going to be 0 0.036 joules. Cool, and that's kind of an example of just about all the calculations you might see involving, involving an RL circuit. The hardest one is definitely the time dependence, so, but I made the numbers nice so it wasn't so bad. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.